All right. Thank you so, um, so much, Anthony, for having us here today. And thank you for T for agreeing to, to talk with me about these, uh, I think, really interesting ideas. Um, so as as Anthony mentioned, uh, but just this idea of hostile epistemologies that, you know, it's nothing about the agent themselves that's necessarily, um, you know, wrong. It's not something vicious about their way of, of thinking or inquiring in the world. You know, we are just overwhelmed by the uh, the information that's around us and how we process it. And we need these shortcuts, these cognitive shortcuts. Um, and just the very fact that we need these shortcuts to get by in our day-to-day -day life opens up certain vulnerabilities, right? That that can be exploited um, and can be the cause of um, where our thinking or inquiry goes wrong. And, and in this paper, um, for those who haven't read it, it's there are kind of two one main ones you focus on, right? One, this, this sense of clarity, almost like a metacognitive emotion of this aha moment when something seems to make sense to us. And then as well as, as trust, um, trust that we have to have in many others, but especially experts uh, to kind of get most of the knowledge we have to get by in day-to-day -day lives. And maybe just wanted to kick off by just asking, how did you get interested in this topic, right? It's one of these things that like you read this paper and it's it's so clear. It's so well written. You're like, oh, of course. Well, that makes so much sense. Uh, why, why haven't we thought of this before? Um, and was it something that you just kind of developed in reaction to some of the stuff in social epistemology we're reading, or was there, you know, something more personal, some kind of an event or um, uh, a realization that you know kind of made you think about this alternate way of looking at it? Um, I let me start by thanking everyone for being here. Thanks. Uh... Thanks, Anthony, and thanks to Johnny. Um, I I think, you know, sometimes when I teach epistemology, I start with Descartes. And Descartes' first meditation is something like, look, I became aware, people don't, they skip ahead and they don't look at that first paragraph. And the first paragraph is really like, I became aware that what I had believed had been so infested with lies, I had to throw it all away and start over again. And when I teach this to my students, some of my students are like, who hurt Descartes? What happened? And I want to say something like, you know what? He literally found out that the earth wasn't the center of the universe in like his lifetime. Like that's the kind of thing that shakes you up. And I had a similar, I think, I think I have an origin story, which is something like I came to realize that many things my parents had told me about everything, about what was important in the world, about how the way the world worked, about how you had to be were wrong. And I, I also had sometime in my life, this like starting from scratch moment. But I think like, it's funny to start with Descartes because I think Descartes is really what a lot of us are kind of pushing back against in social epistemology. Like Descartes has this image, like you can just throw everything away and start over again. And I think I didn't have a good, I, I knew there was something really important that was missing from a lot of the stuff I was doing. Um, and in graduate school, I become obsessed with what I thought was an incredibly important question that I couldn't convince anyone else in philosophy was important, which was the question of how a non-expert picks which expert to trust. And this is a problem that actually shows up in Socrates. This is an old problem. And most people, at least in philosophy, think it's just solvable, right? You can just figure it out. And I think, no, if you actually, what I started to think was if you actually come to grips with the the incredible difficulty of managing trust in experts outside of your um of your pen right of your specialty if you really take that seriously then a lot of how you think about the world has to shift so there are two kind of like papers that like just shook me up and like changed everything about how I thought about epistemology and philosophy and basically like what we were doing as thinking beings in the world. Uh, the first is Elijah Milgram's The Great Endarkenment. Elijah Milgram is a philosopher. Uh, the book, The Great Endarkenment, the first two chapters are about how he thinks that the essential problem or our era is the problem of hyper-specialization. That arguments, any practical argument crosses so many fields that not any person in particular, no single person can actually master the entire argument. And that I think for me was like, no, that's it. That's that's what the life in the world of sciences is like. If you actually try to explain to somebody, right, why you're taking antibiotics, unless you're a very, very specific biological expert, you can't do it. And the other is Annette Byers, Trust and Antitrust, which I know everyone, I think kind of this foundational moment in the trust literature. So I know that Johnny and I know this paper 
intimately well, but for everyone else. Annette Beyer uh, kind of kicks off the modern conversation in trust and philosophy with this remarkable paper called Trust and Antitrust. She uh, was, I think, avowedly a feminist epistemologist. And the paper basically starts by saying, like, it's it has its eyes on political philosophy and the notion of a social contract. And she ends up saying, like, this idea that morality starts in free and equal people of power, voluntarily agreeing to come into association, she literally says, that's something that only rich dudes in a gentleman's club could have ever considered plausible. Moral life starts in vulnerability. And she ends up giving this account that what it is to be, to trust someone, there, there's a more technical account that comes later, but for her, the key is that what it is to trust someone is to make yourself vulnerable by putting something in their power, and in particular, putting something in the power of their goodwill. And I think like a, this makes a lot of people really nervous. Like I was teaching this once um, and in an intro class and I had a uh, a student in the back, this big guy was just like, this is why I don't trust anybody ever. It makes you vulnerable. You can't do it. You can never trust anybody. And I was like, big lecture class. And I was like, how'd you get to school today? And he was like, I drove. And I was like, on the highway? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, how many people did you trust with your life in a five minute moment on the highway? And if you actually think it through, it's like, it's actually impossible to describe how many people you're trusting. It's not just the other drivers, it's the brake mechanics. It's the scientists who came up with the brake fluid formulations. It's like, it just spreads out of sight. And one of the things I quickly have noticed is when you talk about this stuff, even though you kind of vaguely know it, when you actually just try to work out how many people you've trusted with your life literally in the last five minutes, the structural engineers, the people that made the support, right? Like the experience is vertigo. Like it becomes dizzying and nauseating. Right, right. Yeah, no, you you bring up a great point where, right, so you have someone like like a Descartes or the kinds of moral philosophers that Annette Bayer is reacting against of confronting this problem and, okay, I'm going to solve it, and I can solve it as an individual, right? I can go to foundationalism. I can try to build up, I can tear down the house, uh, build up from the foundations, but I can do that myself. Um, whereas, you know, someone like an Annette Byer is like, no, let's lean into the vulnerability. Right. Um, but what's interesting about that is is sort of from, at least from the perspective of a, of a Cartesian or someone who wants to do that from the individual perspective, there's a there's an optimism to it. Um, which when we lean into that vulnerability, there's there's kind of pessimism. When you read a lot of your work, especially on on that expertise problem, there's there's a lot of pessimism about a novice's ability to ever really kind of tackle that problem. If they can't, they if they really can't just kind of looking at the, the litany of different obstacles in their way. I mean, I think I, I I think you're setting me up to say what both of us believe, which is right. that's only pessimistic if you had a fantasy that the best state right. was to be an independent individual who didn't have to trust anybody and who did right. like could be wholly self-contained. And right. the fact that we're we're plunged into this world where we have to I mean, in Annette Byer's description, like your first things that you do is you trust people to feed you and then they're not gonna kill you. Like that is an act laden with trust. Either you see this as the pessimistic loss of some kind of like incredibly crucial independence or you embrace deep sociality but it is terrifying i mean it i mean that that was a very optimistic thing to say but for me a lot of this stuff shows up as very terrifying and the terrifyingness involves the degree to which we we try to manage, but can't manage our trust. And a lot of this, I mean, for me, a lot of this, what, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic in the Cartesian or Bayerian sense, comes down mm -hmm. to a fairly technical question, which is, can you have good reason and how confident can you be in the selection of experts, which experts to trust? I think there's a presumption that you can, so for me, it seems obvious that if someone has a, a keen specialty, like how would I possibly vet immunologists or climate change modelers, like they know so much stuff. Yeah. So there are two kind of routes. One route, I think some people want to say something like, look, I I'm, I'm interested in what you think about this, by the way. Uh, some people want to say like, look, there's some kind of core intellectual virtue that's kind of noticeable, that's independent of any expertise. And if you can figure out how to pick up on that one thing, then you'll know who to trust without having to know their specialization. I think if you actually try to execute this in the world, if you actually try to do something like 
try to figure out whether the science of ADHD medication is like something that you should trust or be suspicious of, and you actually go into the weeds of the literature and the people, right? Then you, yeah. you, you can't. The other route is a large scale institutional credentialing service, but that actually just pushes the problem over, right? So now I trust this stuff because it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which uses reviewers from fancy universities. And so now my trust rather than being managed, has kind of been displaced this large network of institutional decision-making. Right. Yeah, and, and not only that, but it opens the door for, and this you know connects to the idea of a hostile epistemology, to um, faking the signals, right? Those, so right. Those, those credentialing institutions, they are signals of, of trustworthiness right. that you kind of put in lieu of, of, of the verification itself. Um, and there are plenty of opportunities for... Um, and it, maybe when you go even further down to say like, what well, makes an right. institution good? And then you have to look at accrediting institutions, right. all these things that are so much behind the scenes uh, that they can very easily be sort of gamed. Um, right. And like, you might know vaguely that a good institution should be accredited in some way, but you don't know what the accrediting bodies right. are or, you know, which ones are good ones or not, you know, and then there's so many different ones for each region that, you know, someone could say, oh yeah, this university is accredited by... And they can make up a name. Right. Uh, can, can, I, a can I try something out on you? This is, I yeah. think we were supposed to talk about old stuff, but I've been writing this thing. Uh, yeah. And I'm completely, I came up with a new way of putting something uh, in this, right in this space. And it depressed me. And I sent it to my friends to ask them to break this argument. And it depressed them. And now I'm just looking at this thing. And it, it, it's about this kind of accreditation thing. So there's a paper I've been thinking about a lot from Paul Smaldino who is a cultural anthropologist, cultural evolution person who does computer models. And the paper is called The Natural Selection of Bad Science. And here's mm. the paper. It's a, it's, a, it's a modeling paper. And it says, okay, here are a few presumptions in our computer model. Model one, there is uh, the presumption one. There, there's some gap between what will between what gets you good science and what gets you published more often, right? And that, that's a really, that's a well-known gap. That gap is basically, if you, if you lower your rigor standards to the minimum requirement, you'll get more positives and you'll get more publications. If you're really rigorous and careful, you get fewer publications. Two, high status jobs go to people with more publications. Three, graduate students tend to imitate people with high status jobs. And then he asks, mm -hmm. How quickly does everything turn to shit? And the answer is things turn pretty quickly. And I think that's about that signal, right? So I mean, especially if our proxy, I mean, here's a very specific case. I think a lot of people here probably know well. If you're trying to use an institutional proxy for which scientists or academics to trust, and your proxy is something like citation rates or publication rates, right? That's gameable. There's a gap between that and quality. So right. here's, here's, here, here's what I'm thinking about. Here's a generalization. For any social institution, there are going to be some signals that the institution uses to confer social status and social power. If you assume that there's any gap between that signal and what's actually good quality or epistemically good, mm -hmm. right? then you should assume that the people that optimally target the signal over the real thing will gather social power more quickly. That's the mm. argument. This freaks me out, by the way. This is, this is something I literally wrote last week, thinking about Smaldino's argument. And it freaks me out because it's not just an argument that there might be a distinction between institutional trust systems. It's that there's kind of an inevitable force if you think there's any gap between institutional, right? And anyway, so that, the, I just want to put that there because that's the current pessimism that I'm currently uh, trapped right. in. Right, well, and pessimism even, even further in the sense that um, there, there is, maybe add another thing, there's, there's absolutely no way to avoid that gap. Right. That gap is a, right. is a necessary gap. Right, um, this is, and I think that because, we, because if you talk about the stuff we're talking about, institutional trust, you end up mm -hmm. talking about, for me, uh, transparency metrics, like that's how we establish institutional trust. And I think there's a really good argument um, from the hum humanistic study of quantification and in general, the humanistic study of transparency that gives us a reason 
to really worry, uh, to, to think that gap is inevitable. So I found this argument. Uh, so both of us, I think, another connection between us is we're both obsessed with Onara O'Neill. So Onara O'Neill did this incredible work on trust in um, in professional circumstances. Uh, by the way, for, for the geeks in the room, um, Bayer's view was that uh, trust tracked a sense of goodwill and Onara O'Neill's response was no a lot of the times you think the doctor you the reason you trust your accountant or your doctor is not that you think they have goodwill it's just because you think they're a professional right they they're fulfilling their role they may not care about you. anyway side effect so they're, they're committed in, to some obligation right. that they feel they hold in virtue yeah, of their they, right they they you might trust them because you think that they are boring and hold to their commitments and they made a commitment to the Hippocratic right Anyway, right. so th that's cool for people that are interested in trust. So Anara O'Neill, um, in autonomy and bioethics, she doesn't talk about this directly. She comes close to it, but in a, a public lecture series of hers called the BBC Rights Lectures on Trust, she has this really short argument where she says, people think trust and transparency go together, but trust, but transparency system, sorry, people think trust and transparency go together, but they're actually in tension because... Transparency asks experts to explain themselves to non-experts, and they can't because expert reasons are by definition not transferable to non-experts. So they have to, so experts have to deceive, they have to invent fake reasons. So I have this paper, Transparency and Surveillance, where I tried to spin out this argument. And one of the things I thought was it might even be even worse because in many cases, experts might bind their actions to those that can be publicly justifiable. Right. which means they'll actually stop acting from their expertise. And so I think you get this weird, this is a little like, I think a little drill down look at this big tension that we're both interested in. So what I ended up saying in that paper was, look, transparency does work to ferret out bias and corruption and transparency mechanisms. I mean, they're founded on distrust, right? The, uh, so Brian Kogelman, who's a political philosopher, makes this really clear in his history of transparency and political philosophy, that what transparency systems come about from is the sense that politicians might be doing something crappy with our money. So we need to monitor them. Right. But that's in deep and essential tension with our need to trust experts, right? If you're asking an expert to be transparent, you're asking them to justify their actions in terms that the public can understand but the whole point of using an expert was to be able to trust someone who understood something you didn't. So one of the things I'm really interested in is that there's just this ineradicable tension. And that tension arises from this, from the background tension, right? The, the background tension of, look, we're always needing to trust experts to do things that we can't understand. So if we do that completely, we're totally vulnerable. We can be totally screwed over. But if we try to reel them in to our understanding, then to that extent, we're cutting them off from their expertise. And I think like yeah. that tension, I, I, I don't think it's accidental. I think it arises from like the basic problem of us being limited cognitive beings that like each sees a little patch of the world and then somehow has to link them up correctly. But we have to do the linking from inside our limited patch. Yeah. Do you think that where transparency is actually sort of rooted in distrust, that there's something of a of a mistake in the target of the distrust when it comes to something like um, transparency around expertise. I'm thinking in particular of Mina Krishnamurthy and her paper about the, the democratic value of distrust right. and how you know distrust of institutions is actually a, a good thing and, and um, distrust born out of um, right. this institution can, can um, be an extra check and balance against institutional right. power, especially where it spills into tyranny. But there seems to be something about like, like the sort of vertical distrust that she talks about between institutions and the citizens below them. Um, and we might say that's, that's like a healthy distrust, whereas right. um, that distrust being sort of carried over into asking for transparency from experts is sort of misapplying that distrust. Or do you think they're kind of one and the same? I think it's really hard to be sure when you're misapplying or applying. I mean, because, because of the whole epistemic puzzle we're involved in, right? So, I mean... Okay, so the, so the claim is never trust more, trust unlimitedly, because the world is full of bad actors and malicious right. actors, right? Right. I mean, so Nora Nia said one of her famous um, lines from that TED talk she gave, sort of like people will say we, we want to have more trust, we want to generate more trust, these sort of things, and I think those are stupid aims. I think is what she right. said, and because there's always this problem. You want to, I think the kind of her memorable line is 
you want to trust the trustworthy and positively right. distrust the untrustworthy. Right. And that's the very problem of trust is how do right. you, the episode problem of how right. do you differentiate the two? Right. So, yeah, exactly. So here's, here's the problem. If we didn't have any trust, we could never use experts and we would have to be like basically in a box by ourselves, not using any science or like having a babysitter, or, right? Total distrust doesn't work. Total trust opens the door to complete corruption, complete bias, complete domination by bad actors. So the right balance, so the the full, the completely unhelpful way of putting it that is also deeply true is you trust the trustworthy and not trust the untrustworthy. But since the entire epistemic problem is, so is that people's expertise is run out of our sight, right? <laughs> That generates, I think, a deep problem, right? I mean, we can we can trust, I mean, I trust our babysitter. Mm -hmm. Not only do I have a lot of contact with the person, but also like, I think crucially, what a babysitter does is not an arcane expertise that occurs out of my sight. I think it is basically something where you can watch and see how they're acting. And then you have to look for signs of goodwill, but that's, that's the kind of action that isn't essentially out of sight. Now mm. I have to trust a uh, statistical modeling of climate data. Mm. I don't, that's not right. Right. So, I mean, that that's the, 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 it is both, I mean, I think the position that we're put in, I mean, here's another way to put it. If the scientists are large and the world is so complicated, the only way that we can actually understand things and know things is as a huge collective unit, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a place that some philosophers end up. They're like, okay, knowledge is perfectly social. Great. But that doesn't eliminate the second problem, which is that individuals have to figure out which communities to be part of, and they can't get they can't vet the community properly because that would require knowledge that is by its nature too large for your head. Mm -hmm. right. You, right. I mean, there's something you can do, right? You can, there are some signs that work, but the, the essential problem is about the tininess of our consciousness and the tininess of our mind and then right. managing the tininess of our mind makes us trust other people, but then we have to manage that trust with our tiny, tiny mind that understands almost nothing and has yeah. almost no time. Yeah, yeah. So I want to I want to ask a couple of questions, kind of foreshadow, like leading into a particular way. But starting off with this idea of, so a lot of what you write, not only in the hustle epistemology paper, but some of your other papers about like propaganda and polarization and senses of clarity, where there's a clear sort of like there there are bad actors that are right. out there that are going to exploit these cognitive vulnerabilities. Um, and how much of is like should their focus be on that, and how much room is there for the same sort of effects of hostile epistemology, but that just are arising as sort of a, an amalgamation of right. our cognitive vulnerabilities bumping into right. each other, where there's no, to again, maybe, to maybe I don't know if this is a, a fair way of, of, of framing a lot of your work in this area, but of reacting to vice epistemology, which wants to put the blame on the individual right. for their shortcomings, um, but sort of removing that blame onto external bad actors and how much do we just want to like eliminate the blameworthiness because it's no one's real fault, right. but because we're all um, cognitively vulnerable and finite beings that are necessarily have to be bumping into right. each other, this stuff just right. happens. Yeah, I don't, I don't think bad actors are necessary at all. Okay. Um, I mean, they're definitely out there, right? But they don't. They that's don't. one possibility. I mean, I was yeah. kind of using bad actors in that paper as a kind of way to help us think about what would make the world be hostile. I mean, it, right. it's kind of, it was kind of a hat tip to Descartes again. Like there's yeah. not a, really an evil demon, but just imagine. And I think it was supposed to be like, look, imagine they're bad actors. How would they build the world to deceive, to deceive you and take advantage of your own vulnerabilities? Now you know what the structures that look like will look like if they're able to deceive you. Now you can go looking for them when they look like other things. So here, here, here's one way to put it. Like, if you imagine someone trying to get you on board with a belief system, you can imagine them making it 
appealingly clear. So this is, so I, I have this paper called Seductions of Clarity, which was one of the backbone papers for the paper we're talking about now. And I was trying to imagine like how something could be too clear and what, mm -hmm. what, um, so my theory is something like, look, there is a feeling of understanding. So what is understanding? So philosophers of uh, so, some social epistemologists and philosophers of education and philosophers of science have tried to um, talk about what it is to understand and what it is to understand, it, they think, is not just to grasp individual facts, but to grasp like a whole, right? To mm -hmm. see a full model and to see how powerful it is and see how much you can explain and be able to pass that model on. And I thought something like, well, Imagine someone wanted to game your sense of understanding, wanted to build something that felt like understanding. How would they do it? They would max out its comprehensiveness, its ability to explain things, and its ability to be communicable. And what that looks like to me is a conspiracy theory, right? That's a very easy, quick model of the world. And so now you have this thought, look, if you have an overclear model that easily explains things, right, that's comprehensible by anybody, then you have this really powerful engine of seduction. But you don't need to think that the only way that you get such a model is by someone trying to be overtly manipulative. There are lots of reasons that oversimplified models might just show, like, you could just think of, so there's, sometimes I get these very like, mar these like marketplace or evolutionary mini models in my head. Like, okay, imagine there's one really complicated, nuanced, subtle model. Then imagine someone else who wasn't evil, but just trying to understand the world and didn't have the right expertises, came up with something simpler that they could understand. That simpler thing can transmit more easily. Wait, mm -hmm. now we have a reason to think that you'll get the quick propagation of the simpler model over the subtler model. And now you don't need any hostile actors in the space at all. What you get is the fast propagation of comprehensible, easily comprehensible explanatory models and the much slower pro propagation of difficult, sensitive models that require a lot of expertise. Yeah, yeah. So my, my next question along this line is, what effect do you see as hostile epistemology having for the notion of intellectual self-trust? Right. Especially in the sense of uh, someone like Linda Zegzebski or Edward Hinchman mm -hmm. about a, a trust on just your, your sensory faculties to right. That they're going to be relatively accurate and there's not some evil demon just de deceiving us that, you know, what I see, my seat can see my hands and I can touch my keyboard in front of me. Um, is, is, there, is there a consequence or something we should also be concerned about in just our ability to trust ourselves and our intellectual capacities in that sense? Yeah, that's a great question. I have a dumb thing to say, but I think if you give me a second, I'll, there's a more yeah. interesting thing to think about. Okay, maybe here's another interesting path. So one of the most interesting, so let's move from conspiracy theories. The, the other, for me, the other example in that Seductions of Clarity paper of oversimplified clarities that are very seductive was bureaucratic metrics. And if you think about what a metric, so let, let me, let me, let me back up a little and take, take a running start from a slightly far afield. Um, the, there's this incredibly useful field called science and technology studies, uh, that is interdisciplinary, but founded in philosophy of science and then spreads through a bunch of places. And one of the foundational works is Theodore Porter's book, Trust in Numbers. And he's trying to explain why institutions, in particular administrators and politicians, always reach for quantitative, sorry, quantitative justifications over qualitative justifications, even when the quantitative um even when the quantitative justifications are obviously poor. They use poor data, they're like whatever. And he was trying to explain explain that excess trust. Um, he had two explanations. I think the lesser explanation is that politicians use numbers for the pretense of objectivity so that they can disclaim decision-making and look like they're not responsible. That might be true in some cases. If he uses deeper account, and the account looks something like this. He says the difference between qualitative and quantitative information is that quantitative infor that quali sorry qualitative information is rich and nuanced and context sensitive and dynamic, but travels badly between contexts because it requires a lot of shared background information to understand. Quantification in its institutional form involves identifying a context invariant nugget, and then stabilizing that nugget and having everyone collect into the same nugget, and so that nugget 
and the collection procedure and the nugget itself can travel easily between contexts. So this is normally called the portability theory of data. What data is, is a construct that has been made to be portable, which doesn't mean it's false, but it focuses on something that's understandable without context. And that Porter says, gives it a com competitive advantage in being uptaken and understood, right? You might, so in something I'm writing right now, for social epistemologists, the obvious connection is to think there's a kind of systematic epistemic injustice in favor of the quantitative that's explicable specifically because institutional quantifications have been made, have been denuanced and decontext and involve decontextualized evaluative procedures in a way that makes them more comprehensible at scale. So he, here's the worry. The worry for me is in many cases, people seem to trust a metric above an internal sense. Mm -hmm. I have a particularly, um, the philosopher of food, uh, Megan Dean gave me a particularly devastating example. So she says that one of the going theories in the psychology of food is something called restraint theory. And people are trying to explain what it is, what happens to people who are lifelong dieters who keep having, seem to ha having this diet and then binge cycle. And the explanation is something like lifelong dieters spend so much of their time looking at external metrics of nutrition instead of listening to their inner sensibility that they lose any sense of satiety. And so when they're not looking at numbers on a box, they have no sense anymore of whether they're full or not. And so, and so what this looks so like to me- outsourcing trust too much on, on the portability of data and numbers, right. we, we sort of starve our, our sense of self-trust and our ability to trust our own right. intuition. Yeah, exactly. So this is, I mean, this is, so, so I'm not sure if you read, like, I have this stuff on value capture. And my claim mm -hmm. in that stuff is that our relationship to the problematic relationship we have towards metrics can be described as a kind of outsourcing of values. Mm -hmm. And if you think one of the key case studies from that is this incredible book by Wendy Esplin and Michael Souter called Engines of Anxiety. Um, this paper is out, by the way, if anyone wants to read, it. it's called value capture. It's in JESP. Um, that before, so the Engines of Anxiety is a sociological study of the impact of the U.S. News and World Report's law school rankings on legal culture. Mm -hmm. And what they end up saying is one of the things that happens is that before the law school rankings, prospective law school students would use the, mo the moment of trying to figure out which law school to go to would trigger a process of value deliberation where they figured out what was important to them about their legal career. But after the U.S. News and World Report started publishing it rank its rankings, students started assuming that their goal was to get into the best school, and the best school was just set by the U.S. News and World Report. So in that paper, I described it as a kind of outsourcing, but another way to think of it is something like the replacement of a self-trust in your own sense of valuing with an external, with an external institutional force, right? Right. And so, I mean, obviously, one of the reasons the U.S. News and World Report started doing its rankings, which was a very good reason, was that a lot of people didn't have a lot of access to the right information about law schools, and that if you made the information public, then everyone had access. Like, you, if you were, you know, a poor kid, kid who didn't know any lawyers, you had access to that information. And that that definitely happens. But at the same time, the the, the weird consolidation effect makes it it's what it looks like is that i mean the way i want to put it is the us news world, world report has access to information that individuals don't but it's also making value decisions about to weight the various metrics and its rankings and when you outsource to it you're uptaking that and i mean i i want to think of this as a sense of i mean as a loss of well okay complication you can think of it as a loss of self trust you could also think of it as a kind of mind extending to an external evaluative object. Because one of the things, one way to think about a Fitbit is you're trusting it and you're trusting it as you're adopting it as an, your evaluator, as your evaluative method. But so whatever, that's a boring way to put it. The, the interesting thing is something like the displacement of trust in your own ability to value with trust in some external large-scale institutional evaluator 
that doesn't have any particular sensitivity to the particular person and the particular personality and the particular value decisions. So, I mean, I, that 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 dynamic for me, and there, we don't have to talk about any hostile actors at all. That entire right. story you can tell with very good, very sensible, very ethical reasons to create transparent metrics to distribute information. Mm -hmm. And then the increased kind of the the increased trustworthiness for some people of highly portable information over anything like an internal measure. And then you get you get this deep eroding of self-trust and trust in your own ability to evaluate things and replacement yeah. with an institutional resource. So I want, I mean, that's incredibly interesting. And, and I want to try, and this for maybe my last question before we move to the Q&A and, and cut me off if you need to, Anthony, but um, I want to try something on you that actually kind of, as I, I think a sort of hostile epistemology with trust and self-trust, but in the complete opposite direction and bringing it back actually to conspiracy theories. So I was thinking about this idea of conspiracy theories as a force that actually drives a wedge between self-trust and self-trustworthiness, but where there's an outsized level of self-trust, especially, yeah. you know, where you you are, you know, deeply wedded to a conspiracy theory, um, surrounded by people who who don't believe it. Yeah. You have to constantly kind of be justifying yourself in some way or kind of defending your beliefs that requires a very high level of self-trust um, that like, you know, I'm doing my own research. I know what the truth is out there. Um, you know, I, I have a kind of a real thumb on the pulse of what's actually going on and, and you just don't really see it um, in a way that might actually mask a, a reduction in self-trustworthiness in terms of evaluating what's out there and wh where that, that reduction comes from might not be a, a vice at all. It could just be, again, uh, an effect of hostile epistemology. Right. But the outsized level of self-trust inoculates the person from recognizing their reduced level of self-trustworthiness, depending on how we cash that out in terms of um, ability to evaluate evidence or something or you know treat evidence with the right kind of weight um, that is going to perpetuate belief in that uh, conspiracy theory. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the this is the interesting thing for anyone in for a philosopher writing about this stuff right now. I thought I was here to defend intellectual autonomy and thinking for yourself. Right, that's <laughs> you know. I thought I was going to go and be like, okay, everyone, it's time to think for yourselves. And now it's like, actually, the idea that you can think for yourself and understand things entirely. And that you should trust your own ability to evaluate large scale phenomena like climate change, right? Mm -hmm. That's the that's trusting yourself over the science is a problem in this case. Like so now, like I think people like you and me are in this weird position of being like, uh. I thought we were in this game to encourage intellectual autonomy, but now we're telling people rightly that you should right. trust the science that you can't understand. And then I think what's left is to figure out how to be autonomous and responsible, managing that trust and placing it well. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, one, one last thing to say, because I can see some of the stuff going by in the comments very loosely, is that I think there's something, one of the things that's really interesting about this kind of large scale portability of data theory is it explains really well while science, why science is incredibly good at certain kinds of things. And I think something like the more contextually invariant a quality is, the more it is like engineering, building a bridge, building physics, antibiotics, the more likely that a, a decontextualizing large scale data aggregation procedure will do really well. The more highly variable a phenomena is, and you might think that one highly variable phenomena is what an individual values and what fits well with their personality, um, the, the, the more difficult it will be for large scale invariant data collection processes to be able to target that. Uh, we can talk about more. There are lots more examples in the space. The, the philosophers of data have some cool stuff, but I think we're supposed to be in Q&A now. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Just, um, just give me one second.
cool. So we've got a number of questions, and normally once the Q and A starts, um, they they keep flooding in. So I thought I'd um link a couple. So DJS asks about the student you mentioned who is committed to not trusting anyone, and you came back with the ideas about drivers, mechanics, car manufacturers, and what their reaction was. And that seems to link to Chris's question, which is um, whether you're discussing trusting domain specific experts or general expertise like right. the one that public intellectuals do or should right. exhibit. So he's asking about the different notion of trust between um, say a shipbuilder building a ship from a public intellectual trying to help you understand the idea of misinformation mm -hmm. and whether to trust something. So yeah, do domain you want to start with that? Yeah, domain non-specific trust is really interesting. I think a net buyer was a net buyer's account is really, I think, pushes us more to think about domain non-specific trust. So a net buyer's view is something like uh what was trust to someone was to rely on them because of their goodwill. And so there's this quality of goodwill that was kind of domain in specific. And I think what you if you get if you buy buyer's theory then you get to a much more optimistic place than the place that i think i'm at where you can figure out who has this kind of domain and specific quality of goodwill and just trust them i am much more aligned with people like onara o'neill here i think there are lots of reasons to trust people that are unlike goodwill and someone might have all the goodwill in the world but they might still be a crappy you know doctor and the, the real problem, the problem that drives the stuff I'm interested in is domain-specific trust, because that's the stuff that really runs headlong into the problem of trying to figure out which experts to trust when they don't, when you don't have any of that expertise, right? That's, that's what creates, I think, this deep dilemma. Johnny, do you want to follow up on the original question or T's response to it? Yeah. Um... So, I mean, I guess I, I'm kind of one of those philosophers that falls in the category of, I I don't really see trust as a, as a two-place relation, right? Where it's just like A trusts B, right? There's, even when we kind of say it in that general terms and how we might um, cash it in terms of a net buyer uh, of just like, I just trust someone because they have goodwill for me. There's usually sort of like a, a hidden or suppressed third term of, I trust them to do something, right? Um, I mean, by herself in that that paper, explicitly takes up what she calls like an entrusting model, right? That she, I entrust something, some good of mine to someone. You know, she doesn't really often define what that good is, but it's sort of built in that there's something we trust them with, but we trust them to do that or to take care of that good because we feel that they have goodwill. And and she kind of admits herself that this tr entrusting model is, is um, sort of uh, um, artificial in some way and that it kind of leads us down sort of the wrong path if we try to, if we run with it too much. Um, but in all of, you know, even some of her most striking examples um, of like someone kind of coming up behind you in a library and maybe like shocking you or scaring you, you know, there's sort of some assumption implicit about what you trust them to do or not do because they have goodwill. You trust them not to hurt you, just randomly attack you. You trust them to take care of your plants when you're away or your pets. You know, you you trust them to um, not fall asleep at the wheel when they're driving the train or something like that. Um, and there's, so there is, I always think there's some kind of domain specific specificity built in to this notion of trust, even if we don't talk about it in those terms. Can I say, can I say one more little thing? I think it's super interesting that, so most of the times when I run through the examples, it's very domain specific, but buyers mm -hmm. opening examples are about how important it is that life starts with trusting your parents. And I think the cases of the way that you trust your parent and the way so the way I trust a mechanic or a doctor is very domain specific. The way I trust my spouse and the way a child trusts their parent is like generally galactic, maybe with a few exceptions, right? Like I've learned not to trust my spouse about one like very specific thing, uh, which is, it's actually kind of complicated. It, uh, she always assumes that everyone pays as much attention to their physical environment as she does. So she often precariously puts martini glasses right in places they get knocked over. So like there, there's one little exception, but otherwise, but I think it's re it's really interesting that in these kind of like 
deep relationships we have with other people that are really close to us, it starts to look pretty domain unspecific with a few exclusions maybe. But then with the rest of our life, when, when you look at the sciences model, a lot of that trust is very hyper narrow. And this, but again, like the problem that I have doesn't get running. Like the, for me, there's no deep epistemic problem with trusting my spouse. Like that's because, right? Because I think that is a kind of general goodwilling kind of trust. The problem for me is always like, how do I trust the the statistician who peer reviewed this paper about medicine in like a journal that I have no idea about any of the methodology? Right. Okay, so we've got a question here. Um, says, I feel you've touched on th this in the conversation, but I'm <clears throat> interested to hear your thoughts on the relationship between hostile epistemology and pseudoscience stroke anti-science. So T, do you wanna kick us off with a few thoughts right. on that? Yeah, so I think this is gonna be, for me, a case of the seductions of clarity thought, right? That a lot of the way, the so the way that, in my conception, the way that hostile epistemology works is that we're constantly, as beings that are constantly pressured for time, we can we often can't fully think things through or fully know things for ourselves. We have to use heuristics and shortcuts, and that's quite rational. And then these can get gamed, right? And I, my worry, I think pseudoscience in many cases is going to be one of these gaming cases where the weird thing, again, for someone like me that lives... Like I trust most science is that I cannot explain or give a neat picture of most of the reasons for what I trust. And if I think I can, and mostly if I look into it, it turns out to be wrong and much more complicated. But someone who's following a pseudoscience typically can give a complete, powerful, sweeping, comprehensive explanation. So if you put us head to head, here, I mean, one... Um, one of the places I got into this, uh, there was this interesting empirical study about which expert ju witnesses jurors tend to trust. And it turns out that jurors are not just bad at picking expert witnesses. They're like picks are anti-correlated with actual expertise. What it looks like is jurors tend to pick people who make clear, declamatory, unqualified, confident statements about everything. And actual experts are often like, well, I don't know, that's really complicated. There's a bunch of possible conditions. Could be this, could be that, right? And I think like, a lot of what pseudoscience gives you is this clear, crisp power to declaim a complete explanation. Super. Johnny, do you want to follow up on the question or T's response? Yeah, no, just not to, I think that's all sort of on point. I, I think that's sort of an interesting area also where um, these two potential sources of hostile epistemologies Set, uh, you know, it's uh, as the section of clarity and trust kind of merge, right? So there's something about a pseudoscience that um, is particularly well packaged to being very seductive in how it is very clear and all encompassing. It has like all the all the loose ends are tied up, which just lends yourself to then trusting it, um, especially from a, from a novice perspective. Uh, in a way, there's some, almost like a, a bit of a double whammy there in terms of how they kind of work together to create an even more hostile epistemology that could be even harder to shake. Um, yeah. Because then you have the sort of the same language of, um, you know, scientific inquiry to try to defend the pseudoscience uh, in a way that makes it appear more scientific. Awesome. I mean, so, um, sorry, T, did you want to follow up on that? Yeah, the, I mean, this is... There's this weird thing where, I mean, the, the place, I, I just want to remind us to be like unsettled and nauseous here because like <laughs> the, the difficulty here is like, I mean, it's easy to be like, oh, trust the science. Don't trust the pseudoscience. Oh, we know. But like the whole problem is when you become aware that some of the sciences aren't being conducted very well, when you become aware of the things like the replication crises where you think that, oh, some of the sciences, um, some of the sciences uh, might be conducting things with uh, statistical methods that have been that have been impoverished to game the publication game. There was this. Uh, I read a bunch of stuff about how uh, the world of sports medicine. Sorry, this is this is this is this comes out of Paul Smaldino's research. The world of sports medicine has published a bunch of stuff that are very low quality studies that involve using 
a statistical method that is actually really crappy, but allows you to get a lot of false positives. And so if that's generally accepted and you don't have enough stats knowledge in the field, then you're going to just, the people that win are going to be people that crank out a bunch of bad publications. And then you get other worries that when you become aware that certain areas, so, um, uh, Jacob Stegenga, who is a philosopher of medicine, uh, points, has this points to these kind of devastating meta studies about, um, uh, pharmaceutical companies and uh so there are meta so there are a bunch of meta whenever there's a drug that comes out there's a bunch of meta studies about whether it works and a lot of meta studies conflict and then someone did a meta meta study about what could, what the predictors were for whether a study said that the drug worked or not and it turned out there's only one correlation which is if a study was funded by a drug company it was much more likely to yield the result that the a meta study that said the drug worked and if it was independently funded it tended not to so you get this but then for me like i i'm also when i give you these reports i'm now trusting statistical analyses from people that i also can't track so like the the the, the nauseating thing is we think we should trust science and avoid pseudoscience but also we know that there are certain parts of the sciences that have been infested with bad methodology or profiteering interests or just status seeking. And now we have to live and decide what medicine to take and which drastic interventions to Thanks. accept. Okay. So I think, unfortunately, this will have to be the final question. I mean, there's loads that have come in and, you know, a lot of really cool ones, but this is Naomi's question, which is looking at institutions. So Naomi asks, can you address the role of what non-experts know about institutions based on how the institutions behave as landlords, employers of non-academic employees, influence of often problematic public policy, et cetera, i.e. as arrogantly dismissing local knowledges and upholding problematic hierarchies? Doesn't that make mistrust rational, no matter how quote unquote good the expert science is? Over to you, T. That's a great question. I mean, I think there are sometimes good reasons to distrust whole institutions, right? When you find that the institution is blatantly evil, like, definitely. And there may be arguments that we should mistrust most institutions. And, but the worries for me are, I mean, part of the problem here is... A question like Naomi's, which is a really good question. Also, hi, Naomi. It's been a while since we've hung out. Um, the question like that presumes that we can easily draw lines between institutions and tell and mark up which ones are behaving well and behaving badly. But I don't even know how to do that. Okay, so let me let me give you a side let me give you a side version of this. So I used to think that so Philip so P Philip Kitcher, philosopher of science had this method of had suggested this method of figuring out which of the sciences were trustworthy through triangulation and his suggestion was okay we know that bridges don't fall down so we can trust the bridge builders look at who the bridge builders trust okay it's the chemical engineer so look at who they trust and you could draw this line through the sciences and I, at first i was like okay there's a solution this is awesome and the more i tried that to apply that solution to the real world the more i couldn't I actually can't tell where the trust goes because I can't, I don't know enough to draw the boundaries around which of the scientific disciplines are. I don't know enough to, so someone in stats might know that this is a good journal and that's a bad journal and that this journal is run by unscrupulous editors and that one isn't, but I don't know that. So if, how, does that make sense? Like, I don't know how to separate a trust that should be separated. Similarly, when you use this language of like institutions and which ones are the bad actors, I don't, when you ask me like, which institutions are the ones responsible for climate science? Like, I don't even know. Should I be thinking it's like Columbia and Columbia is a bad actor, so I should be mad at Columbia? Or is it like the institution of this journal? Or is it this field? It's, it's like, I, the problem is that even knowing where to draw the boundaries so we can start keeping track of which institutions to trust itself requires incredibly arcane expertise, which we don't even have outside of our own little 
discipline. I think if you knew someone coming in and trusting what they thought to be your discipline as a whole, and you'd be like, no, 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 it's not a whole. These people are totally different. But but that requires arcane insider knowledge again. 